Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Villiersdorp Community Church. My name is Trevor Vecker, and I'm standing in for our pastor, Peter de Villiers, who's away on leave. Uh, we're obviously working our way through the book of Acts, and this morning we come to Acts chapter 5, and uh, reading from verse 12 through to the end of the chapter. And so please, won't you turn to that passage with me, and let's work through the text together. But first, let's pray as we come to God's word. Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask now that you speak to our hearts and give us understanding of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever heard uh, the term tectonic shift? That's when the, the, the mantle plates, as it were, in the the, in deep in the earth's inner core begin to move and rub up against each other and these create fault lines which are then responsible for earthquakes and tsunamis and all kinds of disasters natural disasters now the most famous fault line of course at least to my mind is the san andreas uh, which runs through california and and i'm told that it's a ticking time bomb However, the term tectonic shift is also used to describe geopolitics, political events that shape our world. The rise and fall of empires, for example, are seen as geopolitical tectonic shifts. In geopolitical world, uh, um, terms, the war in Ukraine can be seen as a tectonic shift, uh, although it is largely between Russia and Ukraine. Well, we know, don't we, that, that the whole West is united, NATO and all of that, is united really against Russia, but behind all of it is China. And so this great rift, this great tearing, is taking place between the East and the West. China, the ascending power, is challenging the hegemonic power of the United States along with its Western allies. Now, who will end up on the right side of history? I mean, that is the huge, that is the, the existential question that all of us face. Who is going to end up on the right side of history? Well, aren't you grateful that God rules over the nations of this world and that you and I belong to another kingdom? And that geopolitically, it actually matters little on which side of history you end up on. What really matters is this. See, on which side of history will you end up on when it comes to God's kingdom? And it's what our text is about today. And in many ways, it's also what Acts is all about. You'll remember, as we've looked at the book of Acts, that Acts is this stands as a, a transition between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, it's the, the rift, as it were, between the Old and the New. And, and really speaking, it was tectonic. It's that kind of shift. It was massive. It's global. It would forever change the world, the world as we know it. Now, how do we know that? Whatever evidence do we have? that this happened? Well, well, think for a moment about um, when this happens in the natural world, when tectonic plates collide in the bowels of the earth. I mean, what happens then? Well, we get signs and wonders, don't we, of the natural world. You get, you get earthquakes and tsunamis, um, evidence that something big is happening deep within the bowels of the earth. Now, similarly, the language of signs and wonders, when used in the Bible, are evidence that something big is happening. Now, here's the thing. Here's a little quiz, if you want. The Bible story, we know, runs from creation through to the coming of Christ. It's a period of between six to 10,000 years. Now, I'm not going to fight this morning over the timeline. Uh, that is beside the point. But here's the question. Here's the question. During that period, how many tectonic events have happened where this language of signs and wonders 
is used. Any guesses? Over a period of 10,000 years? How many times? What would you say? What would you say if I told you that there were only two? Um, some people would claim that there are three, but I believe there are only two where this kind of language is used. Just two occasions in 10,000 years where this language of signs and wonders is used in the Bible. Now, why are they tectonic? Well, on both occasions, God is doing something great. On both occasions, God is rescuing his people. First of all, on the first occasion, he rescues his people from slavery in Egypt. Now, that slavery was a physical slavery. It was a kind of political slavery. One nation had enslaved another nation. And it was from this slavery that God rescued his people, Israel. Now, here's the thing. Here's the language the Bible uses in connection with that rescue. Listen to what it says. Deuteronomy chapter 4. He did so with signs and wonders and with an outstretched arm. Listen again, has any God ever tried to take for himself one nation out of another by testing, by miraculous signs and wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, or by great and awesome deeds like all the things the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your very eyes? Now, of course, these signs and wonders that Israel experienced in Egypt continued, didn't they? into the period of Joshua and as they entered the promised land. And so the first occasion though, where we find this language used in, in 10,000 years is where God rescues his people from slavery in Egypt. The second occasion is when he once again rescues his people. See, the two occasions are rescue, aren't they? But on this occasion, the second occasion, God rescues his people, not from a physical slavery, but from spiritual slavery, from slavery to sin and to death. And, and there's the thing, or here's the thing, you see, the same language is used. He does so with signs and wonders and with an outstretched arm. On this occasion, of course, his outstretched arm is revealed. And of course, that is Jesus in the Gospels, we read of the signs and the miracles Jesus himself performed. But like the signs and the wonders that continued from Moses through to Joshua, the same thing happens with Jesus and the apostles. And so we find the same language used when it comes to the apostles. Listen to what it says in verse 12 in Acts chapter 5. At the hands of the apostles... Many signs and wonders were taking place among the people. And so, dear friends, two occasions, two occasions in 10,000 years, two occasions on both of which God rescues his people. And this language is used. Now, the first occasion we know was a type and a shadow that pictured the second occasion. So Israel's slavery in Egypt was a type and a shadow of, of the real slavery that the human race is in bondage to, and that is to sin and death. It's a spiritual slavery. Slaves to sin and death. And so what does this language of signs and wonders then make you think of when it's used in this context? Well, we must think tectonic, mustn't we? We must, we must have in our minds that a great shift is taking place in God's kingdom. God is at work rescuing his people from slavery. On this occasion, the Old Testament is being replaced by the New. And it brings me to my second point. You see, in the geopolitical world, the rise and fall of empires can be a time of chaos, can't it? I mean, the waning empire often lashes out as it tries to hold on to its power, and it does everything in its power to resist 
the new order that is emerging. Uh, we see that happening in our world today. But it's also what we find in verses 17 to 33. And I've called it the, the death throes of a dying order. That's a long passage, and so I'm not going to um, read the whole passage. I'm just going to highlight uh, three things out of the story. And the first is the contrast between the apostles and the elite or the established order of the day. The second is the impotent rage of the establishment of the, the, the existing order of things. And the third is the profound significance of this tectonic shift. Now the contrast is obvious, isn't it? I mean, when we read the story, what we find on the one side, two fishermen from, from Galilee, political lightweights, uneducated, although uh, we must say they'd been in the University of Jesus for three years, and that is no light thing. But they were uneducated in terms of the scholarly uh, world of the day. On the other side, you have the elite, the powerful, the, the scholars of the day, the highest court in the land. We've looked at it in previous passages. The most n notable, the most, uh, the, gr the greatest scholars. I mean, yeah, we read of a scholar called Gamaliel. In our day, he would have been dressed in the, the red academic robes of doctoral achievement. Uh, on top of which, we, what we find in the story is that law enforcement are there. The, the temple captain and his guard, brutal people, quick to enforce the law and to carry out the will of the elite. And it was a kind of David and Goliath scenario. In, in modern political terms, well, it would be something like, like Afghanistan and NATO. That scenario that played itself out just a, a couple of years ago. Now the contrast was great, wasn't it? I mean, who then would have proved or thought, thought who would be on the wrong side of history? Well, we know what happened in Afghanistan, don't we? It was a huge embarrassment to NATO, kicked out by men on riding bicycles with sandals on their feet and AK-47s in their hands. It was a real uh, a modern David and Goliath story. Well, what was the consequence of that? Well, we know, don't we, the, the waning empire, the, the one on the losing side, often lashes out in rage. And it's what we see in this text as well. I mean, look at verses 13 to 16. In verse 13, it says that the people held their apostles in high esteem. And, and that was a real threat to the real ruling elite. I mean, nothing stirs up jealousy more than the success of your opposition. And so look at verses 14 to 16. And more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women, were constantly added to their number. You see, the church was growing. It was growing rapidly. Verse 16. Also the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick and afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. Now in modern po political terms, what was happening at the time was really a coup. It was a, a color revolution. It was a threat to the power of the ruling class, to the elite. And so what do they do? Well, they do what the powerful always do. They lash out in a jealous rage. They try to stamp out the threat. They try to eliminate the opposition. I mean, look at verses 17 through to 18. But the high priest rose up along with all his associates, that is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were all filled with jealousy. Verse 18, they, lay hands, they laid hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. And then in verse 33, after jailing the apostles and after their threats proved ineffective, they intend to have them killed. See what it is? The death throes of a dying order. But notice how their, their rage and their attempts to, to silence, to stop the apostles, uh, proves futile. See, this, this color revolution that's taking place is unstoppable. Uh, they couldn't silence its message. No, not at all. 
And it's this message, you see, that, sh that shakes the very fu the foundations of their order, of their world. And here, here we see where the threat was. It was in their message, and listen to it. It's profoundly, profoundly significant. Let me show you why. Look at verse 20. It speaks of how the apostles preach the whole message of this life. That's an interesting turn of phrase. The whole message of this life. That is just um, an, another way of saying the gospel. The whole message of this life is the gospel. But here's the, the profound part. The, the first place where the, the preaching of this whole message of life takes place, where it's happening, is actually in the temple. It's what we find in this text. It's taking place in the temple. The temple, now remember, the temple in the old order of things was the, the epicenter of the whole message of life. It's what the temple stood for. The temple was the symbol that God dwelt in the midst of his people. People came to the temple to offer sacrifice for the forgiveness of their sins. It's where their relationship, as it were, was mediated. Their relationship with God was mediated through the whole priesthood. Now what had happened? You see, the, the epicenter had shifted. This was the tectonic shift. It's no longer the temple. It's Christ. Christ crucified. Christ risen from the dead. Christ who rules at God's right hand. Christ the majestic king. Christ who grants faith. Christ who grants repentance and the forgiveness of sins. See, the, the place where God now dwells is no longer a physical temple. No longer a building. But the place where God now dwells is in those who believe the gospel and bow the knee to Christ as their king. See, the, the epicenter has shifted this is the tectonic shift. Look at verses 30 to 32. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, <clears throat> whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. See, the epicenter has shifted, and this is what shook the old order of things. The temple with its ritual, its sacrificial system was obsolete. It had been replaced by Christ himself. And so, to the old order, to the establishment, this message had the smell of death. This message to them had the smell of judgment to come. And it was rightly so. I mean, listen to what Luke says in his gospel about the woes which Jesus pronounced against these leaders of Israel. In Luke 11, verse 50 to 51, Jesus said, Therefore, this generation, speaking of these people, will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been said, shed since the beginning of the world. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, Jesus said, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for all. And it's why these rulers were so deeply troubled. In verse 20, you see, it's, it, to them, it's, uh, uh, what the apostles are preaching is the message of life. But to them, it smells of judgment, it smells of death. Look at verse 28. We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name. And yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. And then they say, this is what they say. And you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. See the judgment that they were hearing. You see the death they were smelling in the message. They saw it as judgment. You intend to bring this man's blood on us. They seem to have forgotten that when Pilate washed his hands and said, you know, I'm innocent of this man's blood, they themselves had cried out, his blood be on us and on our children. That is, they were willing then 
to suffer the judgment it would bring. And of course, ultimately, it did bring judgment. We know that. The nation of Israel was judged. I mean, the whole edifice, the, the actual physical temple was raised to the ground, destroyed by Rome in AD 70. And, and the Jewish people were dispersed throughout the world. The great diaspora, diaspora. But this tectonic shift that we, that we read of in this text, it happened just a few moments earlier. So Jerusalem is destroyed AD 70. The actual tectonic shift takes place about 40 years earlier. It happened when Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead. It happened because, you see, God, as it were, drove a huge stake in the shape of a cross into the fault line of human history. And that was tectonic. The fault line in human history was irreparably ruptured, split apart. And that brings me to my third point. And I've called it being on the wrong side of history. Now we often hear that expression today, don't we? We hear it when it comes to abortion. For example, are you on the wrong side of history? Or when it comes to things like critical race theory and social justice, are you on the wrong side of history? Well, here's what it actually means to be on the wrong side of history. Look at verses 34 to 42. Now, this is a familiar story if you've read Acts. And some of you probably a few times, you will know the story. Gamaliel, the scholar, uh, stands up to speak. Now, we are not told, but let's assume that he was an impressive figure. People knew him. They knew of his, his intellect and his qualifications. And the leaders, of course, listened to him and respected him. He might or might not have been dressed in his academic robes. We don't know. But what he is to say is, is quite simple, and yet it's very profound. Now, I won't go through the whole of Gamaliel's argument. It's quite long, but it's summed up in verse 38. And listen to what he says. <clears throat> so in the present case, I say to you, stay away from these men and leave them alone. For if this plan or action is of men, it will be overthrown. He then says, but if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or else you may even be found fighting against God. And so, dear friends, here's what it means to be on the wrong side of history. To be on the wrong side of history is when you end up fighting against God. It's what happens when you oppose the message of life the apostles were preaching. It's what happens when you oppose the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. What happens is you end up fighting against God. You end up on the wrong side of history. And it's what these rulers did. We are told that they had the apostles flogged and then they let them go. But they themselves didn't change. See, the message didn't, as we've mentioned before, didn't even move the needle on, on their radar, didn't even flicker on the, the, the meter of their faith. They were opposed to the gospel of Christ. And so you have picture the scene that we have in this text. On the one side, the apostles, uneducated fishermen. On the other, the powerful, the ruling elite, the scholarship of the day. Who was on the wrong side of history? Well, I'm a, I must say, and speaking to us all here, it might be that you've joined us today, whether it's in church or, or on, on YouTube, and you're not a Christian. And I must say, it's always good to have you join us. It's always good to have our non-Christian friends join us, either in church or on YouTube. And I hope that you would do so again. But dear friends, this applies to you as well as it does to me. Where do you stand when it comes to the message of life? 
the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. On which side do you fall? You see, does this message have the aroma of life to you? Does it smell of life? Or does it smell of death and of judgment? See, what is your response to the gospel? What is your response to Jesus Christ, the man, the Lord, who died for sinners on the cross and rose again from the dead? I mean, that is what it's all about. That's the gospel. That's the message of life. And if only these rulers had known, and perhaps some of them did come to faith a little later, but if only they'd known about the blood they'd shed, the blood of Jesus. You know, they thought that the apostles' teaching was bringing judgment on them. You see, to them the gospel had the smell of death. What they didn't understand was the enormity of what God had done in the death of Christ. You see, they didn't get that the cross of Jesus, the stake, as it were, that was driven into the fault line of human history, that brought about this, this tectonic shift, that had changed the whole order of things. They didn't get it. I mean, Jesus, in quoting the old order, in that passage in Luke said that the blood of the prophets, this was the old order, the blood of the prophets cried out for vengeance. And here's what the leaders didn't get. The blood of Jesus is different. See, the blood of Jesus doesn't cry out for vengeance. No, not at all. The blood of Jesus cries out for forgiveness. Isn't that what he said on the cross? Of Calvary, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. See, it's why your response to Jesus and to the gospel determines on which side of history you fall. Because this promise is for you. It's for me. And the, the sign and the wonder in our day of a tectonic shift taking place. Well, it's not miracles and healings, is it? Although, I mean, we praise God when those things happen and we we would pray for the sick and those who are not well. In fact, on Wednesday, we heard a wonderful testimony from our friends, uh, Pasha, and uh, of him being healed. But the, the tectonic shift, however, is when a person believes the gospel. It's when you or me puts our trust and our hope in Jesus Christ. And so what I'd like to do today is just plead with you, is to, with all my heart and with all my soul, plead with you. Plead with you. Don't resist the gospel. Or to resist or to oppose or to, to even ignore the gospel is to be found to be fighting against God. And that is to be on the wrong side of history. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word here. We ask that your word would settle in our hearts, that you would help us to understand it, help us not to just hear it and understand it, but Lord, that the death of Jesus would indeed be the realm of life to us, that we would put our trust in him and our love and our hope in him and bow the knee to him as our King and Lord. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, dear friends, thank you so much for joining us. May God bless you on this Lord's Day. May he keep you and watch over you. Amen.